Leading up to December of 2016, Englishwoman Ashley Earl had been dating 22-year-old Jack Can for about two months. On the 22nd of the month, Earl saw Can waiting outside her Bracknell home in his MGZR. As Earl would later report, she was surprised to see him because they hadn't made plans to meet up. It was around 2 a.m. and Can ignored the woman when she asked him to turn off his engine, which was causing noise in the neighborhood. Earl then confronted him while filming on her cell phone, at which point Can accused her of being with other men. Videos captured by the woman's phone and by the motion-sensitive dash cam of her Astra VXR captured the moment that Can reversed his vehicle and ran over her foot, breaking it. He then dragged her into the front seat of his car and drove off. Within a few minutes, Can crashed into the back of another vehicle and smashed into a fence before his car came to a stop in a ditch. Can then grabbed Earl by the hair and dragged her into the Barkham Woods, where he struck the woman in the face with a log and held her underwater in a stream. Looking back on the incident, Earl would remember, I was in the middle of nowhere and convinced I was going to die. Before she heard Can call her sister to say that he was actively killing her, the woman managed to escape Can's grip and ran for roughly a mile on a broken foot. She reached the main road and was met by Thames Valley police who'd already begun searching for her. Earl posted photos of the various injuries she'd sustained in the attack, including of her post-op foot which required the insertion of screws and metal plates to mend. At Reading Crown Court, Can was arrested and convicted of inflicting grievous bodily harm, making threats to kill, dangerous driving and driving whilst disqualified. In 2017, he was jailed for four years. Number 11. Helen Ann Williams A 44-year-old South Carolina woman viciously attacked her husband with a ceramic squirrel on Christmas Eve 2013 in a domestic violence incident allegedly triggered by the man's failure to bring her beer. The unnamed 41-year-old victim had left their North Charleston home with the intention of buying alcohol, but given that the shops were closed for the holidays, returned empty-handed. He then started making a sandwich when he was ambushed by his wife, Helen Ann Williams. She struck him in the head with the ceramic squirrel, and when the decorative object broke, she stabbed him in the chest with the remaining piece. The man was able to escape the home and alerted the authorities from a neighbor's house. When a unit from the sheriff's office arrived at the home early on Christmas Day, they found the victim covered in blood. His injuries weren't reported as being life-threatening and he subsequently received treatment for them. Williams claimed that her husband had cut himself following a fall but couldn't account for the blood on her own clothes and hands. The middle-aged woman was arrested and jailed on a charge of criminal domestic violence. Number 10. Christine Jolene Zan. Law enforcement in Camden County, Missouri was called to a camper where 47-year-old Christine Jolene Zan was living. Shortly after midnight on November the 19th of 2018, responding officers found a man dead from a gunshot wound on the camper's floor. In Zan's initial statements to the police, she claimed that she'd opened the partition and saw a man running aggressively towards her, prompting her to grab a rifle and shoot him. However, during further questioning, Zan admitted that the victim only identified as DRH was her ex-boyfriend. She'd heard him in the camper after she'd returned home from a bar at around 10.40 p.m. Zan claimed that they argued for at least a half an hour and that she grabbed the rifle because DRH was exhibiting aggressive behavior. While DRH wasn't reported to have made any physical contact with the woman, Zan told the police that he was hovering over while clenching his fists and growling. She reacted by arming herself with the rifle. Zan said that she'd intended to scare the man off before she ended up shooting him. When asked by investigators why she hadn't fled, the woman replied, this is my home, adding that she'd run away during a prior domestic dispute and that DRH had chased her. Zan was jailed on a $500,000 cash bond after being charged with second-degree murder and armed criminal action. Number 9. Blake William Linkos On June the 7th of 2023, Ohio teenager Natalie Martin was found dead in a hotel room in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina while she was on a trip celebrating her high school graduation. Several of the 18-year-old's friends were staying at the same vacation rental, including her ex-boyfriend, Blake Linkos. The pair, who'd recently graduated from Philo High School in Duncan Falls, 
had dated for three years up until their breakup in February. The relationship had abruptly broken down due to an incident in which Linkos, a high school wrestler and football player, had assaulted Martin in front of their friends. One witness to the violence reported that he took her and threw her across the room. Friends claimed that Linkos desperately tried to reconnect with Martin and get back into her good graces in the aftermath. In the days leading up to her death, the pair had been seen arguing because Martin had reportedly texted another man. On June the 6th, the group went out clubbing but Martin said she wasn't feeling well at some point during the evening and opted to return to the hotel with Linkos. Two friends went back to their shared accommodation shortly before 11pm and had to get into the house through the back because the front door was locked. As time wore on, one of the teens heard loud thuds coming from a different section of the house. Upon checking the door to the bedroom where Linkos and Martin were sleeping, the teen found it was locked by 7am. All of the revelers had returned to the Mason Drive home roughly two hours later. Linkos emerged from the room with bleeding wounds to his chest and told the others, Natalie's not waking up. The cuts to the man's torso were later suspected to have been self-inflicted. Two of Martin's friends went into the bedroom and saw her unresponsive on the floor. They attempted CPR but found that the team was beyond saving as she was cold and stiff. Her manner of death would be determined as homicide through manual strangulation. Law enforcement suspected that Linkos had killed Martin with his bare hands and then spent several hours locked in the room with her corpse. Linkos was arrested for murder on June the 8th. Updates from the end of the month indicated that his bond was set at $150,000 upon the condition that he waive extradition to Ohio to be on house arrest with his parents, wear an electric monitor and undergo a mental evaluation. The victim's family stated at his bond hearing that he should never ever be free again. Number 8. Daniel Chacon 30-year-old Texas man Daniel Chacon was arrested on October the 6th of 2022 at the Laredo Port of Entry in Texas. The man had recently fled to Mexico following the murder of his ex-girlfriend, mother of four, Myra Gutierrez. On October the 3rd, the authorities in Pasadena were called by concerned residents who'd seen 38-year-old Gutierrez being dragged into her own SUV at gunpoint. Witnesses would later identify the man holding the gun as Chacon. Later in the day, the SUV was found abandoned in southeast Houston. Gutierrez's body was inside and the woman who shared a baby daughter with Chacon had been killed via a gunshot to the head. Chacon fled to Nuevo Laredo, Tamaulipas, Mexico, around the same time that he was named as a person of interest in his ex's murder. He later turned back to the US and surrendered to border officials. The man had a criminal history of violence against women in Harris County, which dated back at least a decade prior to his latest arrest. He'd been convicted twice for assaulting his common-law wife and once for violating a protective order, as reported by ABC 13 on September the 14th, of 2022, less than three weeks before she was murdered, Gutierrez had gone to Chacon's apartment to visit their child. During the visit, an argument broke out and Chacon allegedly grabbed her by the hair and dragged her through the apartment. Upon reporting him to Pasadena police in the incident's wake, Gutierrez noted that he'd assaulted her on several other past occasions, leading up to the woman's violent murder. They'd been feuding over custody of their daughter. Chacon had reportedly visited his uncle the day before the incident and told him, I think I'm going to have to kill this girl. Chacon went by his uncle's place again later, telling him that he'd messed up and asking to use the phone as well as for a new shirt. Following his surrender to federal authorities, Chacon maintained his innocence through his lawyer with the legal representative claiming that he'd fled the country because he'd panicked. Chacon was charged with capital murder and kidnapping. Prosecutors argued that he was a major flight risk and a judge consequently set his bond at $5 million. Number 7. Michael Manis In August of 2023, senior citizen Michael Manis called the police from his home in Hasbrook Heights a suburb in Bergen County located about 15 miles from New York City, to report that he'd returned home to find his wife, Judith, dead. The incident appeared to have been a violent home invasion, but it would later emerge that Manis had staged it to look as such after murdering his wife. 
During questioning, 71-year-old man is admitted to suffocating the woman with a pillow, but the motive for the killing remained unclear. The man also confessed to having pondered several scenarios, meant to cover up the murder before ultimately deciding to make it appear as if a home invasion had occurred. Towards that end, he hid jewelry belonging to Judith in a basement ceiling and also disposed of other valuables in a dumpster behind a 7-Eleven, which was located about a mile from the home that the couple had shared since the mid-1990s. Once news of the killing began to spread, a neighbor from the quiet suburban block told a local media outlet, I was really surprised. I'm surprised anywhere. I mean, evil is evil. You know it's bad, so it was unfortunate and sad. After he'd confessed to killing his wife and revealed the circumstances surrounding the attempted cover-up, Manis was charged with first-degree murder, second-degree desecrating human remains, hindering apprehension of oneself and filing a false report to law enforcement. Number 6. Angelita Nicole Wright in November of 2017, South Carolina woman Angelita Nicole Wright was sentenced to 30 years in prison after she was found guilty of running over her estranged husband, 36-year-old Brent Tesnier. The latter's body was discovered in the road on Cemetery Street behind a Hardee's on December the 27th of 2015. Earlier in the day, he and Wright had argued before he went out to buy Christmas presents for their children. Also on that day, 25-year-old Wright reportedly learned that private photos of her had been posted on social media and she suspected that Tesnier was the culprit. Friends later testified that she made comments threatening to kill him. That evening, Wright was in her Ford F-150 pickup truck with 19-year-old Mark Blackwood. They spotted Tessnier in the proximity of a convenience store. Blackwood would later report that Wright put her foot to the floor of the pickup truck and fatally struck Tessnier before abandoning his body. During the trial that followed, a computer and cell phone forensic analyst would report that calls had been deleted from Wright's log around the time of the murder as well as between 11.19 p.m. on December 26, 2015 and 2.04 a.m. on the 27th. The evidence was used by the prosecution to build a timeline for the night of the murder. Investigators additionally found out from the couple's friends that Wright had thrown a brick through the window to retrieve Tesnier's cell phone and had also contacted a life insurance company to inquire about his policy. Number 5. Willie John Selman. An exchange of gunfire at a home in Apple Valley, Minnesota left a woman dead and two men severely injured in July of 2022. When the police arrived at the address, they found 48-year-old Michelle McGill's lifeless body lying in the driveway. The deceased woman's son, 25-year-old Billy Joe Pryor Jr., was present at the scene with various gunshot injuries. He admitted to having actively participated in the driveway shooting that had left his mother dead, and he was arrested after being taken to a local hospital. In the incident's wake, a man pulled up to a hospital in Burnsville with two gunshot wounds to the head. The vehicle and the gunman matching the driver's description had been spotted at the scene of the Apple Valley shooting. The suspect was interviewed by law enforcement and identified as 39-year-old Willie John Selman II. He told the police that he'd been involved in a long-term relationship with McGill and that they'd recently broken up. He went to the home to pick up some belongings, at which point he came upon McGill and Pryor, each seated in their respective vehicles which were parked side by side. Pryor then backed up so that his vehicle was lined up to Selman's. He allegedly told the man that he had a gun which he brandished in the moments that followed and opened fire. As reflected by an official complaint, Selman then got out and ran to the front of McGill's car because he believed Pryor would stop shooting if his mother was between them. Selman pulled out a pistol and the two men exchanged fire with McGill being fatally caught in a hail of bullets. Selman had sustained two gunshot wounds to the head, one of which had left him with a bullet lodged in his jaw that would require surgery to remove. He was charged with second-degree assault with a dangerous weapon and reckless discharge of a firearm, while Pryor was charged with second-degree assault and possession of a pistol without a permit. Number 4. Shanna Gardner Fernandez Florida man Jared Bridigan was driving home through Jacksonville Beach on February the 16th of 2022 
with his two-year-old daughter in the car. When he stopped to move a tire that was in the middle of the roadway, 33-year-old Bridigan, a software developer for Microsoft, was returning from a weekly dinner with his twins, aged nine, whom he shared with his ex-wife, Shanna Lee Gardner. After their 2016 divorce, the latter got married to Mario Fernandez Saldana. In 2018, Bridigan remarried as well, as the toddler in his car was shared with his second wife, Kristen. Upon encountering the tire, Bridigan got out of his Volkswagen to move it. In the moments that followed, he was gunned down in cold blood. His child wasn't harmed and found in the vehicle's back seat when law enforcement reached the scene. The tire in the road had been deliberately placed by the trigger man, 61-year-old career criminal Henry Tenon. He was charged with the murder in January of 2023, at a time when he was already in the custody of the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office on unrelated charges. Tenon subsequently negotiated a guilty plea to second-degree murder in exchange for him agreeing to testify truthfully against any accomplice. His testimony would reveal that the ambush had been orchestrated by Fernandez and Gardner. Bridigan had what was described as a highly acrimonious divorce and a contentious relationship with his ex-wife and Fernandez. The divorced couple was still embroiled in a bitter custody battle. Fernandez and Gardner, who'd moved to Washington due to mounting attention surrounding the case, were arrested for first-degree murder and other associated charges within months of each other in 2023. Gardner, who was indicted in August, denied any involvement, but reports indicated she'd played a key role in the plot. The case was due to resume in the fall of 2023, and according to updates, Tennant's cooperation with law enforcement meant that he'd face a minimum of 15 years for his role in the conspiracy, while prosecutors had stated an intention of seeking the death penalty for Gardner and Fernandez. Number 3. Ruben Javier Rojas On June the 5th of 2023, Arizona man Ruben Javier Rojas surrendered to the Glendale Police Department and was charged with the murder of his ex-girlfriend, 20-year-old Miranda Castillo. The couple shared a two-year-old daughter and in April, Castillo sought and was granted a protection order against Rojas by local police. By early summer, the pair was embroiled in an unspecified dispute on social media. Consequently, Rojas went to Castillo's apartment complex near Northern and 51st Avenues in Glendale, clad in all black and wearing a face mask. He jumped onto the balcony of the woman's third floor apartment and broke through a glass door. Castillo was inside with four friends and her daughter. She called 911 moments before Rojas opened fire from the balcony. One of the women present at the scene took Castillo's daughter into the bathroom and they were unharmed. Castillo and two other women aged 19 and 20 suffered multiple gunshot injuries. Castillo passed away in a local hospital. The 19-year-old woman was pronounced as being in critical but stable condition while the third victim was listed as being in stable condition. Following his surrender to Glendale Police, Roja faced charges of murder, burglary, and aggravated assault. Today's topic was requested by Perfectly Imperfect 8528. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Amber Wright Florida teenagers Seath Jackson and Amber Wright dated from December of 2010 until their breakup in March of 2011. The relationship was described as toxic by the couple's friends as it reportedly involved the teens consuming illegal substances together and constantly trying to make each other jealous. After Wright had started dating 18-year-old Michael Bargo, she and Jackson began a bitter feud on Facebook. Bargo developed an intense hatred towards Jackson, fueled by the fact that he'd incorrectly come to believe that he'd assaulted and abused Wright. At the time, Bargo was living at the Summerfield home of teenager Charlie Eli, along with 20-year-old Justin Soto and Wright's teenage stepbrother Kyle Hooper. The latter also had a grudge against Jackson after finding out that he'd slept with a girl he liked. The teens, under Bargo's initiative and leadership, then devised a plan to kill Jackson. On April the 17th of 2011, Wright texted and lured him to Eli's house under the guise of working things out and getting back together. Jackson sensed a trap and reportedly asked Wright if she was going to have him jumped. She claimed that she would never do that to him, reportedly texting the teen, I just want me and you back. Jackson met her and Eli then walked to the latter's house. 
When they arrived at the address, Hooper ambushed Jackson and hit him in the head with a blunt wooden object, later reported as being an axe handle. Soto joined in the attack, as did Bargo, who shot Jackson twice with a 22 caliber firearm. Wright and Eli hid in a different room as an injured Jackson was able to crawl out of the home and reach the road. He was then tackled by Soto and shot by Bargo. The duo and Hooper carried Jackson inside the home, placed him in the bathtub and broke his kneecap so that he would fit into a sleeping bag that Bargo had planned to use to dispose of his body. Upon realizing that Jackson was still clinging to life, Bargo assaulted and shot him several more times with the bullets also hitting the victim in the face. The teenagers then placed his body in a fire pit and set it ablaze. Some reports indicated that they partied outside as the body burned before putting his charred remains in paint buckets. The following day, Soto and Bargo dumped the buckets, weighed down with cinder blocks at a flooded quarry in Ocala to which they were driven by James Havens, Wright and Hooper's stepfather. Hooper helped Eli and Wright clean up the scene with bleach, but they failed in eliminating the evidence. Eli and Hooper's DNA would later be found in blood mixtures at the scene that also contained Jackson's blood. Bargo's DNA was located in a blood mixture on the kitchen ceiling. The murder plot unraveled after Hooper confessed to his mother. Hooper, joined by Wright and his mother, walked into a police station and told detectives that Bargo had shot Jackson without mentioning their own involvement. Wright initially feigned ignorance and according to the interviewing detective, put on quite a performance. She and the other accomplices were all arrested for first degree murder and subsequently tried as adults. Habens was given the lightest sentence after pleading guilty to being an accessory after the fact. Eli eventually pleaded guilty to second degree murder, served nine years and was released. Wright and Hooper received life sentences with parole available after 40 years. Soto pleaded guilty to avoid capital punishment and was given life without parole. Ringleader Bargo was given the death sentence and as of the latest information available on the matter, was still on death row. If you did not see our video about seven scary female psychopaths just yet, then you can stay tuned after number one if you would like to. Number one, William Lowe. Law enforcement in Delray Beach, Florida received a 911 call about a suspicious item along the Intracoastal Waterway on July the 21st of 2023. Responding officers reached the scene and spotted a suitcase with human remains hanging out of it floating in the water. The suitcase had been weighed down with landscaping rocks and featured an airport barcode sticker for Latam Airlines with the name Barbosa. Two more suitcases of similar contents were located and law enforcement determined that the body parts belonged to the same female victim. The police also discovered a tote bag inside of which there was a woman's head that had a bullet hole in it. They released photos of the luggage as well as a reconstruction of how they believed the woman might have looked. Through dental records, investigators identified the woman as 80-year-old Adil Barbosa Fontes. Witnesses who lived near the waterway reported coming across a man whom they believed might have been looking at one of the suitcases on July the 20th. When asked what he was doing, he reportedly replied that he was waiting for the big boat to come into the harbor before nervously climbing into a gold sedan. The man and his vehicle were spotted by witnesses and caught on CCTV several more times in the area. He was twice seen climbing the dock ladder and spotted seemingly pushing something in the water. Detectives located a golden Ford Taurus near the docks and upon running the plates discovered that the vehicle belonged to Fontes' husband, 78-year-old William Lowe. The police interviewed him on July the 31st and he claimed that Fontes had gone to Brazil and had been there for roughly three weeks but provided no further information about her trip. Upon executing a search warrant at the couple's apartment, the police found blood throughout the living room, dining room, hallway, both bathrooms and the master bedroom. A 9mm pistol and blood-covered cleaning supplies were also discovered at the scene. As officers were executing the search warrant, Lowe got into the home through a back window and told them he needed to retrieve his phone and the keys to a storage unit. When the police searched said unit, they found a Ryobi chainsaw with blood on its blade, chain and housing, as well as bone matter, 
flesh and human hair in the housing of the saw. Lowe was arrested on charges of first-degree murder and abusing a dead body. He stopped talking to the police in the aftermath. The case was still under development and a motive for the killing remained unspecified as of the latest updates. When asked about the crime and how it compared to others he'd worked, lead detective Mike Liberta told the media, I'd say this is probably the worst I've seen. Number 7. Katrina Ipaya New Zealand teenager Katrina Ipaya got into an argument with a woman over loud music while at a house party in Avonhead, Christchurch. In August of 2017, Ipaya, aged 18 at the time, had had a troubled upbringing and was known to have gang affiliations. As the confrontation with 32-year-old mother Alicia Marie Nathan escalated, Epaya stabbed her several times with a kitchen knife in an alcohol-fueled rage. She warned others at the party not to call for help for Nathan and threatened to kill another woman in attendance before fleeing. She was eventually arrested and pleaded guilty to murder, for which she was given a life sentence with a minimum of 10 years served in May of 2019. On September the 11th of the following year, Ipaya was transported from prison to Middlemore Hospital to get treatment for a hand injury. The face tattoo 22-year-old had earlier asked for compassionate release so that she could attend a cousin's funeral in Papakura. Before her expected transfer back to prison, Ipaya slipped her loosely fastened handcuffs and fled from the hospital on foot. It was later revealed that she deliberately hurt her hand as part of the escape plan. A warning was issued to the public not to approach the extremely dangerous fugitive under any circumstances. She remained on the run for roughly two weeks before she was recaptured and had nine months added to her sentence. Most recently, in February of 2022, Ipaya launched a one-woman riot at the Christchurch Women's Prison. She used furniture to barricade herself in an area that was fenced off and part of the secure perimeter. Ipaya blacked out windows and a CCTV camera before she made her way to the prison's roof through an access hatch. She used a metal bar to destroy property estimated at over $18,000, including roofing material, skylights, and a satellite dish. Negotiators talked her down and she once more had time added to her sentence. Number six, Isabella Guzman. In 2020, TikTok users started sharing clips from the 2013 arraignment of teenager Isabella Guzman, set to the Ava Max song, Sweet But Psycho, with some users trying to imitate her odd facial expressions in the courtroom. Guzman's rise to internet fame and consequent fandom occurred as she was in a mental institution for brutally murdering her mother. On the night of August 28th of 2013, she went into the bathroom of their Colorado home as her mother, Yoon Mi Hoi, was taking a shower. Guzman, who was then just 18 years old, stabbed the woman over 70 times in the head, neck, and torso. The teen's stepfather made his way upstairs. After hearing a thud followed by blood-curdling screams, Guzman blocked the door at first and her stepfather called 911 when he saw blood pooling underneath it. When he went upstairs again, the teen left the bathroom and said nothing as she walked past him with a bloodied kitchen knife in hand. The man found his wife naked on the bathroom floor and covered in stab wounds. He tried to revive her, but she was ultimately pronounced dead at the scene. Guzman was arrested at a nearby parking garage the following day, where officers found her wearing a pink sports bra and turquoise shorts that were still covered in her mother's blood. During her arraignment on September the 5th, Guzman smirked pointed to her eyes and adopted the facial expressions that would later gain attention on the internet, along with what users described as her attractive and seemingly innocent appearance. Guzman pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Doctors found that for years she'd been suffering from paranoid schizophrenia with delusions and hallucinations that greatly altered her perception of reality. Guzman didn't think she'd killed her mother, but a woman named Cecilia in order to save the world. A judge accepted her plea and sent her to the Colorado Mental Health Institute in Pueblo. As of the latest updates in 2020, Guzman petitioned the court to be released, claiming her schizophrenia was under control and she no longer posed a threat to society. She expressed regrets for her actions, but also noted that she'd been abused by her parents for years. They were Jehovah's Witnesses and Guzman claimed 
that the abuse worsened after she'd left the religion in her early teens. Number five, Alex Titchelman. On November the 22nd of 2013, millionaire Google executive Forrest Hayes didn't return to his California home and his wife became worried. She called the captain of his 46-foot long yacht called Escape, which was docked at the Santa Cruz Marina. The captain found the 51-year-old father of five lying unresponsive in the main cabin and he was later pronounced dead, with drug overdose as the reported cause. Investigators learned that Hayes had secretly been seeing escort Alex Titchelman, whom he'd met through the website Seeking Arrangement, and determined that she'd been with him on the night of his death. As a high-end escort, Titchelman was reported to have had up to 200 clients, the majority of whom worked in Silicon Valley. The police eventually obtained a harrowing video from the yacht that showed, in chilling detail, Hayes' final moments. When he and Titchelman would meet, they'd have intimate relations and partake in heavy drugs. As revealed by the footage, the escort then in her mid-twenties had injected Hayes with heroin. He soon started experiencing medical complications and passed out, with Titchelman seemingly panicking and trying to revive him. However, she then stepped over the man as she finished her glass of wine. Titchelman didn't call the emergency services and instead started wiping down her fingerprints, along with further evidence of her presence. Before abandoning the millionaire in the yacht, Titchelman was arrested roughly eight months after Hayes' passing and eventually pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter. The call girl killer, as she was dubbed by the media, was sentenced to six years in prison and released in 2017. She was extradited to Canada, but less than a year later was indicted for a murder in Fulton County, Georgia. Her boyfriend, 53-year-old musician and club owner, Dean Ryopel had died roughly two months before Hayes from what was initially suspected as an accidental overdose. The circumstances of Ryopel's passing were reinvestigated as he died in an eerily similar manner to the Google executive. Titchelman, who claimed to have found him unconscious on the floor as she got out of the shower, denied having played a role in his death. During her exchanges with a 911 operator, she claimed that he'd overdosed or something also saying that she thought it was definitely accidental. The case was ongoing as of the latest information released to the media. Number four, Victoria Nasirova. On October the 5th of 2014, Russian woman Ala Alexenko, aged 54, went missing after having recently befriended a woman by the name of Victoria Nasirova. On the same day of her disappearance, Surveillance cameras recorded what appeared to be her limp body in the passenger seat of a rental car driven by the latter. Alexenko's badly burnt body was found months later, two miles from her home in Krasnodar. Investigators learned that jewelry and thousands of dollars in cash had been taken from her home. Nazirova became the prime suspect, but managed to flee from Russia to New York by allegedly sleeping with a local police officer, after which Interpol issued a red notice for her. She went on to live in Brooklyn and enjoyed a lavish lifestyle reportedly funded by the various men she lured into her life and by working as a masseuse offering quality massages at home. Nasirova resumed her criminal activity in May of 2016 when she was caught shoplifting furs from a Century 21 store. Emboldened by the fact that the authorities failed to realize she was wanted by Interpol, her crime spree subsequently increased in scope and magnitude. In June of 2016, Nasirova drugged and robbed several men she'd met on dating sites and later tried to pawn off their valuables under an alias. Then in August, she tried to kill and steal the identity of her friend Ukrainian woman Olga Sivik with whom she bore a striking resemblance. Nasirova had befriended the 35-year-old at a beauty salon and subsequently traveled to her home in Forest Hills, Queens, under the pretext of getting her eyelashes done. While in Civic's home, she gave her a cheesecake laced with the deadly Russian-made tranquilizer Phenazepam. The victim was found in time and recovered after receiving treatment in a local hospital. Upon returning home, she realized her passport and employment authorization card were missing. In the meantime, Alexenko's daughter 
Nadez de Ford had learned that her mother's suspected killer was actually living near her in Brooklyn. She hired private detective Herman Weisberg and he was successful in tracking down Nasirova, who'd kept posted on Facebook under a different name. In one of her photos, Weisberg noticed in the reflection of her sunglasses that the stitching on her car seats belonged to a specific Chrysler model. His team staked out Sheep's Head Bay, where the NYPD arrested Nasarova in March of 2017. She faced over 30 charges from her various crimes and subsequently said, I admit doing a part of it, but I will only talk about it in court. Number 3. Hend Bustami Las Vegas woman Hend Bustami made headlines in late August of 2022 through the unusual comments she'd made in the aftermath of her arrest at the Harry Reid Airport. The 28-year-old had left without paying her bill at an airport Chili's, and responding officers found her belligerently drunk. As she was being detained, Bastami accused law enforcement of harassing her because they'd never seen anyone as pretty as her. She was charged with public misconduct, but the attention sparked by the case would be massively overshadowed by the events of October the 26th of 2022. On that day, at around 2.30 a.m., Bostami called the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department and calmly confessed to killing her own mother. She maintained a monotone voice while talking to the dispatcher, opening with the statement, I think I killed my mummy. The operator then asked for her address, which Bastami provided before offering further information about the incident. She reported that she'd struck the victim, 61-year-old Afaf Hussanan, with a table and broke it on her head. The young woman then claimed to have cut her neck. The emergency services went to the home and pronounced Hussanan dead from multiple lacerations believed to have been inflicted with glass shards. Bostami subsequently fled to California, where the police found her covered in blood during a traffic stop and took her into custody. Bostami once again admitted that she'd killed her mother. The murder had been the gruesome culmination of a verbal dispute between the pair. Neighbors claimed that loud arguments were commonplace in their home, also noting numerous instances of erratic behavior from Bostami. The woman whom law enforcement suspected suffered from mental illness had been spotted talking to herself while walking up and down the street, going into residence, open garages, or scattering her belongings outside. Number 2. Kayla Borke In 2012, Kayla Borke was a promising student at Simon Fraser University in Burnaby, Canada, with hopes of one day becoming a criminologist. At some point, however, the 22-year-old woman told a fellow student that she'd been taking forensic classes in order to learn how to get away with something in the future. Borke also made a startling confession that would bring her into the attention of law enforcement. She admitted to have tortured, killed, and dismembered family pets in her hometown of Prince George and that she fantasized about getting a gun and shooting a homeless person. The classmates alerted campus security who contacted the police. Officers searched Borke's residence and found a bag containing a kitchen knife, hypodermic needles, a razor blade, and a mask, along with videos of her killing and hanging the family dog and torturing the family cat. Investigators learned that Borke had pondered killing a roommate and fantasized about killing someone during a home invasion. She would go on chat rooms under various aliases, one of which was Killer Berserk, and vividly discuss her dark fantasies. Borke was interviewed by multiple psychologists who noted that she was highly intelligent and articulate, but had a preoccupation for causing pain and showed no remorse for her crimes. She was ultimately diagnosed as a psychopath with sadistic tendencies. Borke was convicted in November of 2012 of causing unnecessary pain, suffering, or injury to animals, willfully and without lawful excuse killing animals, and possessing a weapon for a dangerous purpose. She was given three years probation with roughly 47 conditions that would govern her life. Due to the fact that she was a high-risk release, Borke, who'd been adopted from a Romanian orphanage as a baby, was escorted to a new residence as her mother no longer wanted her in the family home. Some of the conditions of her release were that she couldn't possess knives and access social media nor associate with anyone under the age of 18, 
have anyone in her home from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., and she had to fully inform any visitors of her crimes and their circumstances. Updates indicated that on multiple occasions, she violated the rule that prevented her from going online. Number 1. Tamara Samsonova Known in the Russian press as Baba Yaga, or the Granny Ripper, Tamara Samsonova had allegedly claimed at least a dozen victims before she was finally arrested in July of 2015. In March of that year, she'd begun caring for 79-year-old Valentina Nikolaevna Yulanova, who lived on the same street as her in St. Petersburg. Samsonova moved in with Yulanova and reportedly liked living in her apartment, but the pair's relationship gradually deteriorated, and the latter eventually asked her to leave. On July the 23rd, Samsonova gave Yulanova an Olivier salad, her favorite dish, after lacing it with phenazepam. Once the woman succumbed to the effects of the potent sedative, Samsonova decapitated and further dismembered her using two knives and a saw. She wrapped her remains in a shower curtain and dumped them near a pond, where they were found by a passerby a few days later. After establishing the victim's identity, local law enforcement went to her apartment and found Samsonova living inside. They immediately arrested her upon noticing traces of blood in the bathroom and discovering more body parts in plastic bags scattered around the apartment. Samsonova, who was 68 years old at the time of her arrest, admitted to killing the victim following a row over unwashed cups. The woman also kept a detailed diary in which she had extensively written about her life, including several other murders. One line read, I killed my tenant, Volodya. It was too easy. I cut him to pieces in the bathroom with a knife and put the pieces of his body in plastic bags. The police connected her to at least 12 unsolved killings in St. Petersburg, which had occurred over the preceding five years and in which all of the victims had been cut up and left in public parks. Samsonova was heavily interested in black magic and the occult, while also harboring a warped admiration for serial killer Andre Chikatilo, who'd killed over 50 people. Much like her twisted idol, Samsonova was reported to have eaten parts of her victims, having developed a particular taste for their lungs. During her trial in December of 2015, she blew a kiss to reporters in the courtroom gallery. She was seen smiling and clapping as her sentence was read out, saying, I am guilty and I deserve a punishment. Samsonova was determined to have been suffering from paranoid schizophrenia, a condition for which she'd been hospitalized three times in the past. Her sentence was compulsory psychiatric treatment at a specialized facility in Kazan for the rest of her life. Thanks for watching. What's the highest number of times you have broken up and gotten back together with a partner? Let us know in the comments section below.